We agree now that the official language for uh, those who are not Arabic speakers, it will be the English language. Uh, I'm honored now to introduce uh, my dear colleague, uh, uh, one of the most distinguished professors in uh, Egypt and in the Middle East, and even all over the world, really, Professor uh, Yahya Salah uh, the professor of ophthalmology in Cairo University. Uh, he is going to uh, uh, give the Hinawi lecture. And those who don't know Hinawi is our late professor Methat al Hinawi. Uh, me, myself, I am really, I, am, uh, I was very impressed by this great man who introduced a lot to the ophthalmology department and uh, he was a pioneer and he was talented and he started many of the procedures earlier than the time started in Egypt. He was a brave man and was a talented man, Professor Hanawi. And that's why Swarz named the, this lecture after his name. Uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Yahya Salah uh, to uh, give his lecture about cataract surgery. The future starts now. Uh, and at every time, the future will start now. So please, Professor Yahya, we are waiting for your <coughs> distinguished lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here in the 33rd annual uh, meeting of ISWARS, and uh, thank you for the organizing committee for inviting me to, for the Dr. Hanawi lecture, and I had the privilege to know him personally and to learn and, and be around for some time uh, years ago. So the future is here. I have no the financial disclosure. Our imagination is the only limit to what we can hope to have in the future. This is Charles Kettering, who has 186 patents. Kettering is as old as men. Most common cause of blindness all over the world, and the number is in. Did you know how many of you knows that couching of the cataractus lens was the main technique of cataract surgery? for centuries, centuries and centuries, for so many years, even up to the middle, uh, the mid 40s, when in China it was stopped by the uh, Cultural Revolution. And it was still used in many parts of the world. And as you can see, it's an outpatient procedure to topical anesthesia, sutureless, minimally inv invasive surgery. So, and it restores vision, but it had so many complications and the success rate in the literature was 20%. So as human being, as doctors, the, the, the search for the best to treat cataract surgery have passed very long way to try to find which is the best way to treat the lens, the, the cataractus lens. And this have passed all in different civilizations until the, the major changes happened 50 years ago when we gradually started to understand more of the anatomy and the physiology of the eye. We started to see better and have better ways to see. We started to have anesthesia, sutures, and the techniques started to improve from intracapsular the, to extracapsular cataract surgery and vice versa until the era of intraocular lenses that came and changed a lot of the progress and have carried on for 50 years with the development of phaco emulsification. All these ideas all, and inventions and innovations through history was carried out by so many people and these were only some of them. So the outcome expectations have changed from that just we want to be able to see to having cataract as a refractive procedure with all the limitation and the details is needed for, for, uh, for this. So we have to, th to see where we are, where are we heading to, uh, to we are having, we want rapid rehabilitation. We, have, we need better diagnostics to before surgery and intraoperatively. We are having better microscopes, better visualization systems, better techniques and the machines. 
better IOL quality and precise calculation, which is the, the era of cataract as a refractive surgery is extremely important. Ability to adjust the IOL power and type postoperatively. We want to restore accommodation and we, have, we should have better innovative drug delivery system that will lead us to the dropless cataract surgery and to minimize or eliminate complications and make it part of the history. So in pre <coughs> first, firstly, I will just cross over that we have changed our examination or we are adding to our in, uh, uh, in, uh, armamentarium, not only examining the, the anterior segment with the slit lamp and grading the cataract, now we have more sophisticated machines that give more information to be able to understand the patient complaint and to have even different terminology like dysfunction lens syndrome and the addition of the anterior segment of the OCT now help us to grade the cataract, to detect the possible complications like in posterior polar cataract, so we are improving the results and getting more information for better calculation. The understanding and our awareness increasing for the ocular surface problem that affects our calculation and biometry as well as the post-operative satisfaction of the patient has become of utmost importance and hence we have better machines, better understanding of treating the, the problem before we do the surgery, which affects the results. What about IL calculations? We need precise IL calculation. The margin of error is not acceptable anymore to be large. So we have moved to have better machines. We get more information to, to put it into these calculation formulas to be more precise in different situations like long or short axial lens or post-refractive surgery. So we moved from third generation uh, formulas to fourth generation formula, formulas and among them Barrett Universal for, uh, 2 is one of the most useful accurate formulas nowadays but not only this we are using ray tracing calculations like the Olsen formula and what is going to be the norm in the very uh, soon future is using artificial intelligence like the RBF formula, Kane formula, Ledes formula which is called super formula because it incorporates the best of all formulas to fit it for each patient accordingly and all these new formulas are using, are applying big data sites, huge numbers of the uh, data is incorporated and computu computu uh, computational methodologies for better IOL power prediction and simpler IOL selection process that is going to be very easy, very accurate, very precise. So the progress of intraocular lenses, we have seen in our life so many progress going on. So the, what is the aim? Each time we think we have reached the best, nothing else is going to happen. There is a lot of things that are going to happen. We want IOS to improve the optical performance, decrease dysphytopsis, which now we are aware of, to improve the range of vision, to restore and provide accommodation, and to provide better uveal and capsular biocompatibility. So this is, I'm going to talk, what is the new normal of a monofocal intraocular lenses? There is a lot of development, I'm just getting some examples like the eye hands or the Vivity, IQ Vivity, which with a special optical design that have a progressive power increase to the center with no dif diffractive rings. And so no, much, much less dysphytopsias and halos can give us increased range of vision and the, in, in, the intermediate vision, which is very important now, is improved. One of the simpler ideas is the pinhole effect using pinhole effect with like the small aperture lenses that can, you, you can have it as an add-on. But the main thing now is presbyopia correcting lenses. Why? Because we are not, the number is estimated that we have 1.8 billion people of presbyopia waiting for a very safe treatment and effective treatment. So actually all our, all our work is going to shift not only treating cataract but presbyopia. So you need more perfection and you are restoring, aiming to restore the real function of the lens <coughs> which is a refractive function and an accommodative function, which we are trying to, to do, to have, and we have improved a lot over the years by having pseudo accommodation. And now we know many of the trifocal IOLs are giving very good results, much less complaints than, than before, but still they have separate foci, they have gaps in between, and there, are, there is still contrast decreased in some 
patients as well as uh, these photopsies. So they are moving ahead again for another terminology, another way to mimic accommodation, which we, the new term is now continuous transitional focus, which we can see in the Synergy IOL, which combines a multifocal platform into an extended depth of focus, getting the best out of both, and the precision presbyopic IOL, which, which as you can see has distinct areas for near and far, but at the end, the idea is to mimic and the, the, the normal accommodation as having a continuous focus from far to near. But the idea will be accommodating IOLs from a long time ago, it was tried, but now we have understanding that the ciliary muscle does not age. So the ciliary muscle contracts, the problem is within the lens. So using this contraction, the IOL is designed to achieve one of three things, either according to the model, either anterior movement of the IOL within the capsular bag, change in shape or curvature, change in refractive index to increase the optical power. And hence we can have presbyopia correction without splitting of light into multiple foci and consequently having very high quality of vision that we are seeking for and the presbyopic patients are seeking for. This is the first generation of single optic within the capsular bag implantation. These lenses all, some of them still used, but the results are not good because it does not persist due to the effect of the capsular bag. Another example was the dual optic, which might give better results like the synchrony IOL, which is a silicon IOL that can fit through four millimeter incision and with it in, in, through the capsular bag, the ciliary muscle contraction can move these two optical parts together, either forward, the positive part moves forward or backward, and consequently giving us accommodation. But again, they fail or they are not the best because the problem, inherent problem in capsular fibrosis. So we have shifting cups in terms of accommodative IOLs. Number one, essentially to overcome what we learned from the past, that it, the, the deterring effect of capsular bag fibrosis, which the, negates all the uh, benefit we get uh, from a cumulative lens. And now we have two main concepts, essential concepts. One is called the open bag concept, that if you keep the capsular bag open without the touch of the anterior uh, capsule to the posterior capsule, you can have, you can avoid posterior capsule opacification and fibrosis. And the other concept, as we know that the, the ciliary muscle is active, so we, we should design lenses that are sulcus fixated in direct contact with, sim, uh, with ciliary muscle. And you can see how we are changing from our mind thinking of only back fixation, now we are shifting to salary sulcus again. Curvature is changing less. The most uh, tried in humans in experiments for like four years now is the Jouvin lens, which has two parts. One is modular part, the modular, it's modular, modular. The first part, which is the blue part, this sits in the capsular bag and fills the capsular bag and hence the, the objective of having an open capsular bag. And then the, the other part, which is the curvature changing liquid silicon optic, where uh, the, uh, through the transmission of the ciliary muscle contraction to the capsular bag, this modular part will contract and the fluid will shift to the center, changing the power of the lens according to the need of the patient. Another uh, lens that is tested is the Opera lens, and it has a dynamic anterior surface and a static posterior lens used to correct the refractive errors and astigmatism. And it is designed for sulcus fixation where the haptics only are fixated within the capsular axis so as to avoid tilt or decentration of the lens. But again, depending on the ciliary muscle contraction directly. This is the luminous accommodative intraocular lens that is, has a fixed power lens that corrects the refractive uh, like any normal lens and a, va a variable power lens that can change the, the curvature of the lens and accordingly accommodation. This lens is, uh, is implanted in the ciliary sulcus through a three millimeter incision. As we can see here, it's only what you need to do is to check and make sure that the lens is resting and the sulcus not in the capsular bag as we are used to, to do in our surgeries. Another concept, interesting concept, is the fluid-based lens technology. In, the, in this lens, the newest model is called Next Gen, 
and it, it's a hollow lens and haptics. It's completely hollow, filled with liquid silicon. And this is placed in the capsular bag, keeping the capsular bag open, avoiding uh, the fibrosis and uh, uh, transmitting the ciliary muscle contraction to the, the, these haptics. And consequently, the, the fluid will move into the, the optic or out of the optic, changing the accommodation power for, for as long as it, uh, we, we, we live with no effect on cause of uh, fibrosis, and it's a very intelligent concept. Another concept is the Atia vision lens, which has two parts, and the anterior part is exchangeable optic. And this is the only one of these types of lenses that the optic, the refractive optic is anterior, so it gives a chance that we can exchange the lens if there is wrong power, or we want to, to add uh, uh, whatever type of, of lens, maybe to rest you, to add to rest you, to it. And again, it is placed in the capsular bag, the main part, the posterior part, and it transmits the cellular muscle contraction. So after talking about all this, talking how we should have accurate uh, formulas, but what if we can change the power of the intraocular lens after we implant it? We are not going to fear anymore that our calculation is not that precise. So we had for many years now the light adjustable lens, with, which is a silicon um, lens, with a photosensitive ma ma uh, macromers, macromers and photo initiators. When subjected to ultraviolet light, you can change the refraction by the way you put the light, either you induce hyperopic or myopic refraction according where the light uh, is uh, uh, initiated. And then usually you start the process 15 days after the, uh, the primary surgery. Patient is not happy with the refraction. He wants monovision or uh, he wants to be myope, he wants to see far, or you are not happy with the refraction, then you can adjust it. And once you decide to adjust it, you do locking, and locking procedure usually very fast, take two sessions, two to three sessions, and once it's locked, usually you cannot change the power, and the patient in between the, this time from the surgery until the locking should wear UV blocking sunglasses, and this is one of the drawbacks. But there is more to come and the more that makes it, things much life much easier and beyond our imagination. Now we have, there is Perfect Lens Company together with the Morin Eye Center in Utah University are, are applying a machine, femto machine, with the concept of refractive index shaping using very simple green light, 520 nanometer below the threshold of ablation or incision to induce chemical reactions within target areas in the substance of the IOL optic, and consequently changing the hydrophilicity as well as the refractive index and changing the power of the lens. Not only we can, with this machine, change the power of the lens, but you can change a multifocal lens into a monofocal lens or a monofocal lens to a multifocal lens. You can add touristy to the lens. And this is, when it is there, it will be a game changer. It's a completely new life for uh, cataract surgeons. PC prevention, as we understood, as we all know, is very important. Long, long talks and papers and research about the optic design and the optic edge, the optic material. All, all of this was, we understand it now, the, the haptics, where we place it, how it looks. All this is very important and this is done already. But now there are other people that think, okay, we open the posterior capsule rexes and put the bag in the lens like Marie Tissot for, and using it for children. And there are special IOL that is created for them to assisted cataract surgery that is fixed in the anterior capsular rexes to avoid any tilt or decentration. Open bag, capsular bag concept, we already said, and surface modification and coating, coating of IOLs to prevent the PCO. So let's forget about all what I said. And now what about if we can regenerate a lens? We don't put intraocular lenses. We will create again a new lens, a clear lens. And this project started in 2015 with this where they tried to test the human warts jelly stem cells were injected into the capsule after minimal invasive surgery, just a small rexes doing irrigation as aspiration in this animal group. And they found that the, the lens capsule acts as a natural scaffold 
and these stem cells could be used to restore the lens structure in the empty capsule. It's a very interesting hypothesis, but some people took it moreover to apply it on animal studies and congenital cataract, infantile cataract, where they just make, as you can see in the pictures, in this, you can, you can uh, make a very tiny capsular axis do irrigation aspiration and leave the stem cells of the natural lens to regenerate after sealing the, the opening of the anterior capsule with a, what we call capsular plug. And the lens will reform clear fibers that will restore. And their conclusion that by preserving the endogenous lens epithelial cells, this technique, the, the, there is natural environment maximally and regenerates lenses with visual function. The approach demonstrates a novel treatment strategy for cataracts and provides a new paradigm in tissue for a tissue regeneration using endogenous stem cells. This is mind blowing if it, if, if it happens. So what we, if we stop using eye drops to make it easier, patients are old, they are not compliant, they put it in the wrong way, they get eczemas, it's a lot of problems. What if we can, have the IOL as a delivery system, long, a, a slow release drugs. Either you coat it on the whole lens or you soak it in the material you want to, to use. And this material is, could be antibiotics and or steroids or anti-proliferative drugs that prevents PCO and consequently avoids so many of the complications we were talking about. And this could use, be used to prevent endophthalmitis post-operative inflammation and PCO. And the last technique of impregnating impregnation is loading the IOL haptics only with the slow release uh, uh, devices to have a slow continuous release of the drug to the, the time that we want. And this is another way of delivering drugs at the end of the surgery through a liposomal drug uh, delivery system where they injected the anti-inflammatory subconjunctival one injection and they showed the results were very safe and they could control any post-operative inflammation. So dropless cataract surgery actually is a dream for the patient and maybe a dream for the doctor not to check on the patient if he's taking drugs or not. And already in the market, you can have some drugs, slow release, that you can inject transzonular or intravitreal. What about the technologies and the techniques? We have evolved. Again, we thought we reached the top in everything, but no, we still have better microscopes now with OCT in incorporated in the microscope that give us details during surgery. We can see the design of the incision. We can see the opening of the incision. We can see inducing desperate membrane detection at the time of surgery. And we also, we have other a viewing system that help us center the capsular axis, the toric IOL, and all this, things that we didn't have in the past, but we are not stopping at this. There is the, three, the heads up surgery where you are using 3D. There are different systems, uh, 3D vision system. So you can see the things in large, big, 3D dimensional, easy for you, comfortable. And although it started in the vitreoretinal surgery, which proved very useful for them, but now it's moving into the anterior segment and cataract, and even there are papers comparing the regular microscope with the 3D in anterior segment surgery and showing it is more comfortable and effective. So we have reached in the machines that we got the, the fluidics perfect, the power modulation is perfect, it's very ergonomic, the FECO machines, as well as the development of better uh, femto machines that are small, easy to manipulate, with low, using low energy to give us the best results in femto-assisted cataract surgery. And uh, most of the reviews up to 2021 just shows that to the standard of the femto laser now, to the conventional, there is actually no difference in the results, and the, the, there is no real justification for the increased cost, and this is something that, uh, that needs to be addressed. But as you, as you can see here, if you look at the, the, the gauge here, I'm not using any power completely. This is the technique that we're using now, so energy modulation. And on the other side, the, now the rex is perfect, the incisions are perfect, there is no bubbles, the technique is simple. But again, you are using the FACO machine at the end of the time. Maybe you have advantages, and this is maybe my indication for femto laser is to do a stigmatic keratotomy to treat a, a certain range of uh, astigmatism. So there are a lot of advances. We are very precise now. We have very good results. But we were saying, 
if what if the FEM2 is nice, it's intelligent, it looks sound, people like the word laser, but what about if we can have a FEM2 machine that you can finish the whole surgery with the machine without using any fake emulsification machine, and this is the term photo emulsification that is now is going to be used, photo emulsification, where this Keranova FEM2 matrix machine is already under trial, where it fragments the lens into 20,000 cubes in 0.2 cubic millimeter volume in 20 seconds, and transmits the fem to second laser beam by fiber optic fiber, so it's much easier for maintenance and less probable to have problems with it. And then you do the surgery, irrigation aspiration for any type of lens, with the same machine, then it will make sense to have the fem to laser really, there will, be a, there will be a great advantage. But what the future carries again, robotic surgery, we see robots everywhere outside here, there is a robot playing the role of uh, somebody you know, introducing the program. So it is actually here, and this is a, 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 a presentation done in 2017 in France using the most famous robot, robotic uh, 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 microsurgical robot, which is called Da Vinci, and trying to implement it in cataract surgery. And the idea of using it, they say that will be a large numbers of patients and less numbers of doctors. You want accuracy, you want complications-free surgery, you don't want tremors. So it, it is taken beyond this by the Cambridge consultants using this access uh, robot that you can see they are comparing the human and with this ro robot, the doctor is sitting, playing with the hand pieces, and he's doing the incisions. And the improvement was always the hinder was how meticulous the hand, you can hold the instruments with this robotic end, how you can manipulate it, the angle you can go inside the eye. So they are improving very, very, very fast to do everything. And everything is done under OCT, so you can actually make it the surgery completely safe because you are not going to open the posterior capsule. So this is like a conclusion of the robotics and the ophthalmology, and they say it needs, it's still in its infancy, it needs a long way to go, although in retinal experiments, they are able with the robot to cannulate a retinal vein. You can imagine how this will revolutionize treatment of many diseases. However, they say that its precision, accuracy, complete automation are positive, attractive properties of this technology. Robotic eye surgery is going to become a norm very soon. And this is very important that we know this. We should learn to play Atari more so as to get used to the, or the PlayStation. So this is just to conclude, interesting, in 2010, Robert Osher, in an editorial, editorial about cataract surgery future predictions, I just want to, I'm thinking what we reached, and remember this is 2010 and now it's 2021. He was taking, talking about a very small incisions done. Complications will be non-existing, not yet, but less. Future IELs will correct all types of pre-existing refractive errors and higher order aberration done. Accurate calculations of IOL power, especially post-refractive, done with the IA formulas. Ability to adjust post-operative results, we are there. Electronic features that offer telescopic imaging and, and distance and microscopic magnification at need. You will be a superman, and this is under, on, on the pipeline. IOLs will contain pharmacologic agents anti-inflammatory antibiotics, high potentives, and PCO inhibiting characteristic on the way. Pre these are other imagination. Everything comes with imagination. Pressure sensing device incorporated in the IOL design for continuous monitoring in glaucoma patients. Not yet. The lens will serve to monitor blood sugar in diabetics and other chemistries. Not yet. The IOL will confirm identity in report security lines so you will pass immediately. And now they are making uh, intraocular lenses that uh, with electronic uh, uh, 
electrodes and sites connected to the pupil that can sense the size of the pupil and consequently transfer the movement from the cellular body to the cell to accommodate and recreate uh, accommodation. So in conclusion, we have gone a long path to reach better outcomes of cataract surgery, to become safer, more predictable, and precise, leaving no margin for error, to customize the higher power as needed, to be able to restore accommodation, true accommodation, with much better quality of vision. And to, co to end, the empires of the futures are the empires of the mind, as Winston Churchill said in the last century, and the future will be brighter. Thank you for your